when it comes to my influence, I have looked a lot on YouTube. Uh, as soon as I have a scene in one of my films, I, I always are uh, checking out if, if, if there's a reference on YouTube. And in, for example, in, in Force Major, there's a scene where, where the main character, Thomas, totally breaks down and cries. And then I went to YouTube and, and Googled worst man cry ever. And I found a beautiful uh, situation in a TV show where there's like this man that have held his sorrow back for so many years and suddenly the sorrow comes bursting out of his body and he can't control it. And so uh, I, w I can do some recommendation, recommendation for, for, for YouTube clips also. So uh, worst man cry ever. Uh, idiot Spanish bus driver almost kills students. Uh, battle at Kruger. <laughs> Uh, and finally, taxi driver interview. It's this is actually not the most how you say comfortable place for me uh, since I'm actually not from the the kind of background of film history. Uh, I started making ski films, but I can find a lot of Rainer Fassbinder movies uh, that I that I really really like. I really like Petra von Kant's. The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant, I think I will pick that one. Viridiana uh, uh, of Bunuel and the, dis the Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie of Bunuel, which I think would be the perfect title for, uh, for my new uh, feature film, Force Majeure. It should have actually had a name of the, the, the Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. I mean, I have seen so many films. I, I, I actually like this one a lot, um, Catherine Breya. Uh, uh, but I don't like this title that much, Fat Girl. I actually like Amazur uh, to my sister. That is the French title. And I, I think that she had an approach to uh, sexual content that was totally new for me when I watched her films. Uh, but this one I actually have, an ex this edition also. So I won't take this one. Um, but I saw over here, it was Love Streams. And this one I will take for my producer, Eric Hemmendorf. He, he said, ah, oh, you have to take Love Streams. Uh, I haven't seen it, but I love a lot of uh, Jon Cassavetes films um, and uh, the, the approach of his filmmaking. And uh, of course, Gina Rowlands, the way she acts is, is just fantastic. So this will definitely be one for the bag. Mm -hmm. And I uh, also saw Bicycle Thieves by uh, Vic Vittori De Sica. And this film was some a film that Roy Anderson was talking a lot about when 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 I went, was in film school, and that has been a really really important film to him. And it was nice to see that you have the right title on the film here. Uh, it's for many years it was called Bicycle Thief, uh, and and I think Bicycle Thieves is a much better uh, title for the film. So that's that's the film that I definitely will take. I will give this to Roy Anderson. No, but I can talk about Ingmar Burbank actually. I can talk about him because I think that what he did when it comes to the Swedish film community um, was that everybody talks about him like the demon director, someone that is so in control and knows everything about, about the films that he is making. And, and maybe when you went to film school as a film student, you were a little bit afraid of exposing that you sometimes are not 100% sure what you're doing. Uh, and when I shot a, a short film that is called Autobiographical Scene Number 6882, um, uh, I made an experience that had been extremely important for me as a, as a director. We were shooting this film uh, on a bridge, a high bridge, and uh, there was only three shots. Um, and we had uh, one camera position each day uh, during this, this shooting of the short film. And on the second day of shooting, uh, I had a, the, a big plans for, for the camera position. I have built up, a, or me and the crew have built up a big tower, a large tower, high tower on the, on the bridge. And on the top of the tower, there was like a, a jib arm in the air above the water. We have placed the camera and it looks like half day of building this this construction to to have the the camera in that position and immediately when i put in the, the bnc cable into the monitor and i could see the image i realized i will never use this shot and 
I ended up with a, 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 a struggle um, because should I now tell the film crew that I have made a wrong decision or should I just like continuing and, and, and uh, uh, pretend like this is exactly how I want to do it because you, I could feel that the history of Ingmar Berman, that you should be a demon director, you should know everything you are doing, was um, relying on my shoulders or on my shoulders. And, and we went to go and eat lunch. And w during that lunch, I had this inner conflict. Yeah, maybe I should tell the, uh, tell the crew everything is right. And we're just continuing the shooting. And then I call them back three weeks later and say, we have to reshoot shoot it. Uh, but... After lunch, I actually gathered all the people in the crew and I said, OK, I'm, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I made a wrong, wrong decision. We have to take down the tower uh, and I have to find the, the camera position myself. So everybody was like at that moment, I thought that, OK, there will be a mutiny. People will not trust me anymore. But instead, there was a very experienced uh, uh, sound designer uh, that came up to me and he said, OK, now I really, really trust you. Uh, because I think that's what filmmaking about. When you are a director and you are on set, you you have a, a lot of pressure on yourself. And if you are leaving your own instrument, if you're looking at something and the image and it's something that it's not exactly how you want it, then you have to be very, very sensitive to your instrument and you have to follow that instrument. And as soon as you are leaving your own instrument and you are just doing things to, to avoid um, uh, struggle during the shooting, then you are also leaving the, the reason why you are a director.